God is more concerned about our nation living in unity than any of us are concerned about our nation living in unity. How many of you know that God loves to pour his blessings out where he can find some unity? And you're gonna hear a story of unity today. So first off, I wanna to introduce to you Will Ford. He's part of the owner of Ford Motor Company and, uh, uh, and then Matt Lockett. So Will, I guess you're starting us off today and give a big hand to Will Ford, not with the Motor Company. We finally found someone dresses better than me. I'm a little embarrassed right now, but have your liberty, Pastor. Come on, give it up for Pastor Mike. Come on. So love. He and amazing staff. It's been an amazing time with y'all. So Matt and I, we travel with props. So uh, while they're finishing setting that up, turn with me in your Bibles, John 17. John 17. And I love John 17 because, listen, it's Jesus praying for us. We actually get to overhear Jesus praying for us. You ever overheard somebody praying for you? I remember years ago, in my 20s, about 30 some odd years ago, I was a knucklehead and uh, was going to sneak into my mama's house a little tipsy from hanging out at the club. <laughs> so I'm creeping into the house three in the morning, but who's up at three in the morning praying for me? My mama, she's going to town. Devil, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Jezebel you, Jezebel, you better back up in Jesus' name. Delilah, I see you. And I plead the blood, the blood, the blood. All right? I'm like, no wonder I couldn't get a date tonight. <laughs> I heard one preacher say it like this. The only difference between a praying mama and a pit bull is lipstick. Because a praying mama don't let go just like a bulldog. But, you know, I listened to my mother pray, and it, honestly, it sobered me up. It messed me up. Years later, I literally gave my life to the Lord, gave my life to the Lord, and uh, said, Mom, you don't know it, but there was this one night I overheard you praying for me, and it transformed my life, branded my life. I see you know I was on the other side of that room listening to you at 3 in the morning that night, but I just want to say thank you. She said, oh, I knew you were there. I knew you were there the whole time. I just wanted you to know what God had placed in my heart concerning his plan, his purpose, his destiny for your life. Amen. Church, I will submit to you, John 17 is Jesus praying for us. And it should sober us up. He wanted us to overhear this prayer that he made for us. So look at John 17, starting at verse... Starting at verse 18. As thou hast sent them, me into the world, even so I've sent them into the world. I'm talking about the 12 disciples. Then he says this, verse 19. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, talking about the 12 disciples, but for them also who believe in me through their word. Turn to your neighbor and say, now he's praying for you. What is he praying? That they may all be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be in one in us, that the world may believe that thou sent me. And the glory which you have given to me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfected in unity. That the world may know that thou just sent me, and has loved them, even as thou hast loved me. Listen, God's going to use United Church to heal a divided nation. And while, you know, all this stuff that's going on with the coronavirus and everything else, you know, social distancing has revealed the social distance in our hearts. But what God reveals in order to heal. And we want to share a story with you of healing that God is doing, not just in our lives, but all across the country. God is weaving us into a powerful storyline that's going to heal our nation. Can I pray for you? Jesus, we love you. We overheard you praying for us. Holy Spirit, we ask you to give us the grace to respond to your voice. Answer Jesus' prayer through a united church to heal a divided nation. In our homes, in our families, one community at a time, we're right here in Visalia. God, we ask you, Holy Spirit, come. Will of God be done. Break in with great power and glory today, we ask. In Jesus' name and all God's people say, amen and amen. Now, some of y'all, y'all probably wonder what this hunk of tin is doing up here. It's actually connected to a powerful speech 
I want to play a little bit of that speech for you right now. If you will, go ahead and cue up that I Have a Dream speech. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream. I love that speech because I'm one of those sons of former slaves. And actually, this kettle pot here comes from the slaves in my family, on my father's side of the family. They use this pot for cooking. They use it for washing clothes. But secretly, they use it in their prayer meetings. That's why it's been passed down for many generations. You know, I don't think it's a mistake also that this kettle pot comes from Lake Providence, Louisiana. Providence is... The co it's the continuous activity of God by which he preserves and governs. It's the way God looks over seemingly insignificant things and apparent accidents. In other words, you have no idea how many things God prevented from happening for you to get here on time. Or how many things that accidentally just kind of happened and you stumbled into this and into that and you thought that's how you got that job or promotion. No, the God of Providence was watching over it all. It's not a mistake the family you're born into, the region that you live in, the nation that you live in. God watches over it all. And the way you understand what providence is doing is through prayer. It's through prayer. Those uncoincidental coincidences that are happening in your life, you're like, oh, I just prayed about that. That just happened. No, God was watching over that happening. I like the way one preacher said, he said like this, when I prayed, the coincidences happened, but when I stopped praying, the coincidences stopped. And the greatest word for, for, to understand that kind of coincidence of what God is doing is Ephesians 2 and 10 where it says that we're God's workmanship in Christ Jesus and we're walking up the works that he prepared for, for us to walk in. The word workmanship, y'all, is a powerful word. It's the word poema. Everybody say poema. So think about it. You're God's poem. You're his song. But even greater than that, the word poema was the word that was used to describe a skillful tailor fabric maker. In other words, God has a tailor-made plan, tailor-made destiny for all of our lives. And sometimes, you know, my, my sister used to crochet and used to do needlepoint, and sometimes she'd be working on something, and all I would see on one side is just knots and tatters and a, one big mess. So what are you working on? She'd turn it around so she could let me see what she's working on. That's what God is doing with this little story of ours. He's turning the tapestry around so we can see what he's been working on, not just in our lives, but in our country right now. So honestly, I hadn't thought much about this part until I went to a little conference. I heard a man teaching on prayer. And he said something so was so powerful. Talked about synergy. Synergy is when you take two separate things and you connect them together. It doesn't create an addition of power, but a multiplicity of power, right? Scientists say if you take two horses and put them together, if they're pulling the same load, it creates so much exponential power, it's as if a third invisible horse has been added. Spiritually, we know that one could put a thousand to flight and two could put what? Ten thousand to flight. So think about it. We'll start getting all this agreement in prayer between red, yellow, black, white, brown, male and female, old and young. We can see the synergistic exponential release in the power of prayer like we've never seen before. Psalm 133 says the blessing. It says what? How good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. And what? Unity is like the anointing oil flowing from Aaron's head onto his beard and onto his rope. And the Bible says for there. Everybody say there. The Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Listen, God's looking for a place called there, which it looks, it looks a lot like a place called here. <laughs> Listen, the ethnic diversity that you have in this house and the unity and the love that y'all have here, I, I experienced this weekend with your staff. Listen, fight for it, y'all. We don't see this everywhere we go across the country. <laughs> Endeavor to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. But then that, that minister that day, Dutch Sheets, he said something so profound. He said this, not only can you agree in prayer with the person sitting next to you, but you can also agree in prayer with the generation behind you. He was talking about how he was at his alma mater, Christ for the Nations Institute, and he's leading the student body there in prayer. And while he's leading them in prayer here at the Holy Spirit, say to him, Dutch, I want you to come in agreement in prayer with the prayers of the founder of this school. And he thought, God, is that you? Because that man's dead. He's been dead for a long time, and I know you're not into talking to the dead. But then he heard the Holy Spirit say this. I didn't say agree with him. I said agree with his prayers. His prayers are still alive before my throne. 
There are things I promised this man in prayer that I want to release into this school right now. But I can't do it until one generation is willing to take the baton from the previous generation to move the chain forward, to pray for revival and pray for awakening in this school. Finally, the scripture in Hebrews 11, 39 and 40, it finally makes sense to me where it says, all these by faith, talking about the great heroes of faith, they were approved for their faith, but they did not receive what was promised. So then apart from us, they will be made perfect without us. In other words, there's this whole company of people, y'all looking over the balcony of heaven saying, hey, y'all, don't mess this thing up. God started something in us that he wants to complete exponentially through you. Jesus said it best when he said, what greater works than these are you going to do because I'm going to the Father. And it starts something in one generation and completed exponentially through future generations. Especially in the place of prayer. When I heard that, I was a wreck because I remember this kettle pot in my family. Like I said, it was used by the slaves in my family. They used it for cooking. They used it for washing clothes. But secretly, they used it for prayer. They were owned by a slave master there in Lake Providence, Louisiana, who would beat them for any reason. And praying was one of them. The slave master didn't want them to get any kind of hope for freedom, though he wanted them to be Christians because he knew that Christian slaves made better workers, but he didn't want them to pray because he felt like prayer would foster hope. And if they got hopeful, he felt like they would try to run away. So if he heard them praying, he would literally have them beaten. I mean, we had stories passed down in our family about Family members that were beaten to death just simply for going fishing without asking. So that's how cruel slavery was in this plantation. And also, I guess a lot for slaves to read and write. All that was is just an interesting time period. That's why they called it the peculiar institution. But listen, the folks who passed down this part in my family, listen, y'all, they were Christians. And in spite of the danger, they decided to pray anyway. So what they would do is they would go into a barn late at night to make sure their prayer meeting wasn't seen. But to make sure it wasn't heard, they used this cast iron kettle pot. So they would go into the barn late at night, take this pot, and they would take it, and they would turn it upside down on the cabin floor. And then they would take three or four rocks to prop up the edges, and then they would prostrate themselves in the ground, and they would put their lips in between the opening between the ground and the kettle so that the kettle pot would muffle their voices, voices as they prayed through the night. And the story that they had passed down with the kettle is this, is that they didn't think they would see freedom in their time, so they prayed for the freedom of their children and the next generation. One day, freedom does come. There's this young teenage girl in our family. She decides to keep this pot and that story in our family. Now, why would she do that? Because she overheard somebody else praying for her. And she began to think about all the others after her who were recipients of those folks' sacrifice. So she decides to keep this pot and that story in our family, and she passed the pot and the story down to Harriet Lockett. Harriet Lockett passed it on to Noah Lockett. Noah Lockett passed it on to her son, William Ford Sr., who then passed it on to William Ford Jr., who then gave it to me, William Ford III. So can you imagine, I'm hearing this teaching about taking up the baton of intercession from the previous generation, and all of a sudden I remember this kettle pot. And the first thought that came to mind is this, to whom much is given, yeah, much is required. <laughs> Listen, y'all, we won't see what they saw unless we do what they did. Those folks prayed in two powerful awakenings that ended slavery. Not just those Christian slaves, but also white Christian abolitionists, white revivalists. They prayed in the revivals that shifted the cultural landscape of the whole nation. They had a slave master back then that kept them from praying. But listen, y'all, we have a willing master that keeps us from praying. It's called Netflix and chill. It's called social media, entertainment. They fasted and play. They fasted and prayed. We feast and play. Something's got to change. Amen. But beyond the obligation, I thought about the privilege. I thought, oh my God, I get to agree with the prayers of my forefathers for the freedom of this next generation. And I thought about the exponential results that could be released and created from that. Friend, Pastor Dutch, we were talking about this, and we decided to do this prayer journey across the country. And we were going to use this pot as a reminder of the prayer bowls in heaven. Revelation 5 and 8, so they're golden bowls in heaven full of incense. So are the prayers of the saints. Listen, there's a prayer bowl over Vesalia. There's a prayer bowl over California. There's a prayer bowl over this nation. God's looking for a new generation to resource the prayer bowls. He said, you want me to have some cast iron cooking pot represent the prayer bowls in heaven? 
about that time, Dutch said he opened up his Bible and fell open to Zechariah 14 and 20, which says, and the cooking pots in the house of the Lord should be like the bowls before the altar. So here's this cooking pot that's caught him up for prayers and saying there's a bowl in heaven that catches our prayers like incense. Then Dutch said this to me. He said, wouldn't it be just like God in his justice and irony to use the prayers of a slave generation to free a nation up for revival again? I'm glad he said generation because it wasn't just black Christian slaves praying back then. Like I said, there were also white Christian abolitionists and revivalists. Many of them had their houses burned. Many of them were shot. They were killed, and they were even lynched because they chose to suffer with the people of God rather than compromise and wink at slavery. And they knew they were fighting for family. And they helped me understand something. They knew they were connected to the Christian slave because they were connected because of the blood of Jesus. Right? They helped me realize something. See, if my ancestors had been Muslims or Buddhists, I'd have no connection to this part of its history. But because they were Christians, listen, now these my ancestors and forefathers, listen, y'all, they're yours too. If you're a believer, this is part of our heritage. In other words, I'm just as much a spiritual son of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Ch Charles Finney, Finney, and Jonathan Edwards, as you are as Martin Luther King, and William Seymour, and Harriet Tubman, and when we come together in that kind of unity, that kind of agreement, something powerful happened. This is part of all of our history and heritage as believers. Because there was a... Supreme Court law back then called Dred Scott would say that slaves had no rights in the courtroom. And everybody thought that law sealed the fate of slaves in America. But because God said revival, people's hearts go so radical, transform folks in the North who wouldn't have fight for folks in the South that didn't look like them. That's why I'm daring to believe, listen, the same God who brought the power of Dred Scott, listen, y'all, he can break the power of Roe v. Wade. He can put an end to systemic poverty. He can stop our schools from being a pipeline to prison. He can shut down mass incarceration. He can put an end to the opiate crisis in the suburbs or shut down crack houses in the inner city. He's just looking for a new generation of people who will drop their agendas and come together and believe. But the Lord spoke to me and said, William, if you're going to be part of this, you have to deal with your own baggage. So the Lord dealt with me, dealt with my heart issues related to some of the hurt I experienced through racism through a dream that he gave me from Dr., with Dr. King in it. In the dream, <laughs> I'm on my way to Dr. King's old church in Montgomery, Alabama with a friend of mine, Lou Engle. And in the dream, we had to go by this house to pick up Dr. King. So it's a dream, right? So he's alive. Dr. King comes out of the house, but in the dream, he had this humongous white duffel bag with black candles on it. And in the dream, he starts emptying all this dark garbage out of that duffel bag. Then he throws the bag down violently, and he comes again to this vehicle with us. And in the dream, I thought to myself, man, that bag would make, make a nice souvenir. So it was y'all corner lamb, right? Like, even in my dreams, I'm thinking, I went to Morehouse. He went to Morehouse College, too. Like, the bag would make a nice souvenir. That's what I thought. But in the dream, when I go to try to pick up the baggage, before I could touch it, Dr. King grabs me by my shoulders, and he says, No! Do not go back and pick that up. And in the dream, he starts telling me what I need to do to heal the racial divide in our nation. I start to cry in the dream. I wake up from the dream. I'm in tears. I've been weeping the whole night in intercession. I didn't even realize it. I shared the dream with my friend, Lou Engle. He begins to weep. We begin to pray, God, what is the interpretation for this dream? I was like, God, remind me. What did Dr. King say to me? And the Lord said to me, William, the white bag with the black handles, that would be the interpretation for your dream. And I realized the black candles represented my ethnicity, African-American, black man. But the white bag represented my baggage. God was saying to me, William, get rid of your white baggage. You've been carrying it for way too long. So I knew what God was talking about because I know what it's like to be 12, 13 years old. Me and two or three other friends, we were coming out of a convenience store and a Carlo full of white guys pulled up to us, started shouting the N-word at us, said they were going to shoot and kill us. They chased us for two hours. They probably were just joy, joy riding, but listen, we were terrified. I know what it's like in my 30s to get my first nice house in the suburbs and every week have the same police officer every week pull me over just for driving while black. I know what that feels like. But you know what I've done? For every police officer and every white person in that region, in that area, I put those stories on everybody. Before I had one conversation with them, what did I do? I prejudged everybody. 
Isn't that the devil's diabolical plot? His, the devil's diabolical plot is to get us to uh, prejudge each other. That's why they call him in Revelation 12, the accuser of the brethren. That word accuser, y'all, comes from this powerful Greek word. It's the Greek word kategoros. It's where we get the word category. In other words, the diabolical plot of the enemy is to get us to categorize or stereotype each other. So before we have one conversation with each other, we put some bad storyline, some bad stigma, some bad stereotype on each other. God was saying to me, William, get rid of your unforgiveness. Get rid of your resentment. Get rid of your bitterness. Get rid of your white baggage so you can get into a new vehicle that can bring revival and justice for everybody. The question God has for all of us in the church right now is this. Listen, what color is your baggage? Is it red, yellow, black, white, brown? Or is it blue or red? <laughs> Listen, y'all, it's not about the donkey or the elephant right now. It's about the lamb. Left wing, right wing, the whole bird is sick. We need the dove back in America, amen? So the next day I actually spoke at Dr. King's church with my friend Lou Engle, and I had this book that had all of his speeches. It falls open to the I Have a Dream speech. I go up to the, that old pulpit of Dr. King's, and I pull out that book, and I start reading that speech like a prayer. But I get to this part where it says, I have a dream that one day the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will sit together at the table of brotherhood. And I started praying for the first time for the family that owned my family, where this kettle came from. But little did I know that Mr. Poema, God himself, was connecting me to some more unfinished business. So we wound up doing this prayer meeting, January 17, 2005, and that's where I meet this distinguished gentleman. Come on up, Matt Lockett, come up and share. Good morning. What we're giving you this morning is just really the tip of the iceberg, and it, it's very sad that the books didn't arrive here. We're giving you just a little taste of this extraordinary story that God's been revealing to us, and we really want you to get this whole story. God is, is doing something big right now. I had a dream recently where uh, in the dream I was told this is going to be big. I believe that God is revealing stories right now because he needs us to see his handiwork. Like we get, we, we've been so isolated for the last two years, really. God wants us to see the bigger picture of what he's doing, the work that he's already begun. Amen. So what I'm going to do is just start right where Will left off. I'm going to begin on that same day. So Will brought it up to this prayer meeting at the Lincoln Memorial. It was January 17th, 2005, where uh, he had been asked by this man, Lou Engle, to bring this kettle and to bring this story. But I'm going to back up a little bit. And uh, again, what we're doing here is we're telling you a very personal story. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my family and how God... Uh, revealed how my story ties in with Will's, but really you need to understand that this is a story not just about Will and I, this is a story about all of us. Because when God starts revealing his handiwork, what we find out is that we're more connected than we realize and that we need each other a whole lot more than we thought. So January 17, 2005, back up exactly one year to the day, 2004. On that day, something really unexpected happened when I lost my dad. Uh, and he passed away unexpectedly. And so if you've lived through something like that, you know that can throw your life for a tailspin, especially if you don't see it coming. And, uh, you know, I see a lot of mature faces in the room. So you've lived through that. If you're young and you haven't experienced it yet, hate to break it to you, but you're going to at some point. Something is going to happen when you lose mom and dad. The mantle of the story is now going to fall to you. You're actually going to become the steward of a storyline, and you have to begin to make sense. See, I'm a believer, and that means I believe something. I believe that my life has meaning. I believe your life has meaning. And so when you then become the steward of the storyline, you have to start asking big questions about what is the meaning of this story. Do you understand what I mean? And so it was during this time after I lost my dad that I started asking big questions. I was in my 30s, but I was asking questions like, who am I? Why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? And it, that's not a, a weak prayer. That's actually a powerful prayer to pray because it doesn't matter if you're 16 or 60. Your heavenly father wants you to ask those questions. Why? 
because he wants to tell you the answer to those questions. We all need to hear from the Heavenly Father who we are. We need him to tell us why we're here and what is the story that he wants to tell through our lives. And so during that time, one of the things that became very important to me was I wanted to find out something about my family tree. I wanted to learn about where the Lockett family came from. And that was saying something. Now, how many of you have looked into your family trees? Okay, only a few hands have gone up. You know what that tells me? We ask this question everywhere we go and very few hands are raised. That tells me that we are actively losing stories. We are actively in the process of forgetting where we came from and who we are. And your family story is a big window into where you've been and it's a, it's a, gl a glimpse into where you're heading. And so I wanted to find out where did my family come from? And that was saying something because my dad was one of 16 siblings. Just gonna let that sit there for a second. 16 siblings that grew up on a tobacco farm in Kentucky, and they didn't know anything about where the lockets came from. They actually couldn't get past my dad's grandfather because somewhere along the way, somebody stopped telling the stories. The records had been lost, and so my dad would make a joke and just say, we're just mutts from Kentucky. And, you know, we would laugh about it through the years, but something hit me during that time after I lost my dad. I wanted to find out what the truth was. And so I started digging and I just had this determination that I'm going to get the breakthrough on our family tree. And you know what? I hit all the same problems and roadblocks that everyone, every cousin, and I got cousins on top of cousins. Everybody that's ever tried to figure that out, I ran into those same problems. And so I was finishing that year more frustrated than I had even started it. And so it was during that time that I had a dream. Now, Will's talking about dreams this morning. I'm going to talk a little bit about dreams, and I'm not talking about the kind where you had pizza really late at night and something really weird, you know, popped up in your mind while you were asleep. I'm talking about the kind where you go to sleep and you feel like God's talking to you. Do we have any dreamers that dream like that? Okay, see, not very many hands. See, you don't want to admit it. <laughs> It's, I believe it's happening and you don't want to admit that God's speaking, but I believe God's broadcasting. The question is, are we listening? So it was during that time that I had this dream and this dream, it got a hold of me. It came from somewhere else because it was filled with things that I didn't know anything about. And one of the things I want to highlight to you is there was a man in my dream named Lou Engel. And what was interesting about that is that I didn't know who Lou Engel was, but I met him in my dream. And in this dream, God began to show me how he was going to shift the culture of this nation and how he was going to do it through day and night prayer. See, that was the other interesting, thing, interesting part of it was that I didn't know anything about prayer. I've been a Christian most of my life, but every Christian thinks they know everything they need to know about prayer until you have to lead a prayer meeting. <laughs> then it takes about five minutes to realize that you don't know enough about prayer. And so God showed this to me in the dream and I was so provoked by it that I started looking around. I found out there was a real guy named Lou Engel. He was really doing something with prayer, actually doing it out of California, which is extraordinary. And uh, he's really doing this thing in prayer. And so I decided to try to get a hold of this guy because this dream's probably for him and he probably needs a prophet in his life. <laughs> you try to make, you know, sense of these things. So I got a hold of somebody that worked with him and I said, man, called him on the phone, man, I, I don't know you and you don't know me, but I had a dream and he took me seriously on this phone call. Didn't expect that. And he said, what was your dream? And I told him my dream and he said, that's very interesting. You just dreamt exactly what God is sending us to do. We're actually on our way to Washington, DC. We're gonna raise up day and night prayer and God's gonna shift the, the, the culture of this nation. Then he said this, we're gonna do a prayer gathering on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial on Martin Luther King Day. Maybe you should come to it. God might have something for you there. Now, come on guys. I'm just being really honest with you. Like I got a full-time job at that point and it's like, you want me to take time off work, spend hard earned money to go across the country to a prayer meeting. I can do that at church on Wednesday night where we spend 45 minutes talking and 15 minutes praying. <laughs> Amen or oh me. <laughs> it's quiet in here, pastor. <laughs> So it was during that time that I, I got a recording of Lou Engel preaching. And I don't know if you know who Lou is, but I, I just remember he made this one statement. 
that cut me to the core. He said, what moves you? What is your passion? Stay close to the burning bush in your life. What burns in you and never goes out, when you find something like that, draw close to it and you'll hear your name called. That statement provoked me, it cut me to the core. And so I decided I was gonna go to this prayer meeting in Washington, D.C., but I only had one prayer that I was praying before then and I was saying, God, I need to hear my name called. I had lost my dad. I knew nothing about where my family came from and I was praying, God, I need to hear my name called. So I went and I actually brought uh, some pictures. I wanna show it to you just so you can see what I'm talking about. If you could put up the first image, please. This is that prayer meeting, it wasn't huge. That's uh, Lou Engle on the right third of the screen if you know who that is. That's the Lincoln Memorial. That's right where Dr. King gave the I Have a Dream speech. But if you see the left arm on, or the arm on the left side of the screen that's extended, follow it out to the end of the fingertips, you'll see that's Will Ford. So the first place that Will Ford and I ever came together was right there on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in a prayer meeting. Our story begins in a prayer meeting. I want you to remember that. So we prayed that day. I didn't understand why we had to pray outside. In January, when it was zero degrees for eight hours. <laughs> it was a long, cold day, but I showed up. Listen, sometimes you just gotta show up. So we prayed that day, and that evening, there was a guest speaker named Will Ford, and he brought out this kettle, and he told the story that you've just heard this morning. And, and I'm listening to this, and then he shares this detail. He's talking about, you know, the, the slaves in his family who had prayed and here it's one year to the day since my dad had passed away and I know nothing about my family and I'm listening to this and and I'm a, a tearful mess and then he shares this detail that this kettle was handed down to Harriet Lockett who gave it to Nora Lockett who gave it to Will Ford Sr. to Will Ford Jr. to Will Ford III the man on the stage what was my prayer that I was praying before I got there God, I need to hear my name called. I had no idea that God would be that literal with answering that prayer. And so after the meeting, I went up, started talking with Will, and we compared notes. He asked me, how did your lockets spell their name, with one T or two? And I said, two. He said, well, our lockets only spelled it with one T. Where are your lockets from? And I said, well, I don't know. My dad's from Kentucky. And he said, well, our lockets were down in Louisiana. And we thought it was just this amazing coincidence that... It got our attention, but you know what? We didn't make a whole lot of it that night, but the first thing that Will and I ever did together was we knelt at the altar of that church where we were at and we prayed for this nation together. We prayed about the sins of the past and we prayed for another great awakening to come and a release of forgiveness that would change the nation. And so fast forward now, I became a full-time missionary in Washington, DC. You're welcome. You should come to DC, it's fun. All the demons come. You should come too. No, really, it's true. So fast forward, uh, we have a house of prayer that we have established on Capitol Hill. This uh, two weeks ago was our 17th anniversary that we've been praying in a spirit of day and night prayer. And God gave us a dream that marked us at the very beginning, and I'm gonna be very quick about this. In the dream, we were in a huge building filled with courtrooms, and we were being led from one courtroom to the next, and in the dream, the Lord spoke and said, either you deal with Roe v. Wade in your courts or I will deal with it in mine. Now that got our attention, that's very serious. And then at, in the dream, at the end of a long hall, there was a huge courtroom, and on the door it said Appomattox Courthouse. Now, I usually have to do a little bit of American History 101 at this point because you slept through history class just like I did. We fought a civil war from 1861 to 1865. A lot of people thought they knew what it was about. By the end, everybody knew what it was about. It was about slavery. So in 1865, there's a man named Robert E. Lee, who is the general of the Confederate Army. He's cut off in Richmond, Virginia. 
and the Union Army breaks through and they begin to pursue him across the state of Virginia. This is a little bit, I know it's like, if you're over, listen, when we tell the story over in Virginia, everybody like knows this story. But when we go to other parts of the country, they don't know this story. So Lee is in retreat and he gets to the middle of Virginia to a place called Sailor's Creek. And it's there that he's overcome by the Union Army and he fought, Lee fought his last battle near Sailor's Creek on April 6th, 1865. And then three days later, he surrendered on April 9th. So there's your history lesson, but it's important for this story because Lou Engle was gonna do a prayer meeting in Virginia. And he said, you know what, if we're gonna do it, we first need to go pray at Appomattox Courthouse, which is where Lee surrendered. Now connect that to the dream. Why is God using historical language and dropping it into the situation that the nation is facing now? We take that very seriously. And so we go and we prayed at Appomattox and as we left, we went into the visitor center there because it's a historical site. And Lou grabs the first book off of a bookshelf. We're standing side by side. First one that caught his eye, it was this book right here. And he opens it to a random page. And if you could put up the next image, I want you to see the page he turned to. It's called The Last Shot, The Battle of Lockett's Farm, spelled with two T's. And he's like, well, what's this? I said, I don't know. And I began to study this. You can Google it yourself. The last battle that General Lee fought was in the front yard of a family named Lockett. And that was the last battle of the American Civil War. Now, I thought that might mean something because I believe my life has meaning. And so it was uh, right about this time that my older brother got the breakthrough on our genealogy. And he called me. He's like, you're not going to believe this. I got us all the way back to the year 1645, we came in as some, among the original settlers in this nation through the state of Virginia. And I said, Virginia, have I got a Virginia story for you? And I began to tell him about the end of the Civil War. And he stops me and he says, wait a minute, that's not that place by Sailor's Creek, is it? I said, that's exactly where it is. He goes, oh, well, I just found the documents on that property. That was our family. So I want you to understand what I'm saying to you right now. What we found out is that the last battle of the American Civil War occurred in my family's front yard. I actually want you to see the house. It's been preserved. If you could put up that next image, please. That's the Lockett Farmhouse. If we could get up close, you would see it looks like Swiss cheese. It's still riddled with bullet holes from the day of battle. And right there in the front yard is the historical marker. Here Lee fought his last battle. I actually got to go into that house. The man had the locket genealogy framed and hanging on the wall. It was my family. No question about it. Now, what did Will say at the beginning? That when I pray, the coincidences happen. When I don't pray, the coincidences stop. I want you to see this, that the way you kick up into a providential understanding of your life is through prayer. If you pray, things begin to connect things begin to be revealed. And this is an encouragement to us. We need to begin to pray this way. And I believe God's going to reveal his handiwork. And so I met this man who lived in the house. And uh, he said, well, how much do you know about the lockets? Which wasn't much. And he said, you know, some of them left and went to Kentucky. I know that part. And he said, some left and moved down to the deep south. Some were involved in very significant historical events. But then he said this, some left and moved to Louisiana. And in some cases, those handwritten census ledgers, there was a clerical error and they accidentally dropped one of the T's and changed the spelling of the name. And then I was thinking exactly what you're thinking right now. This can't possibly be true. But I gathered this information up and I went down to Dallas, Texas, where Will lives. Will, why don't you please join me and share what we found out? Yeah, so Matt flies from, from D.C. To, to Dallas and lays out all this research. And honestly, we just, we just talked and prayed and cried. And then when he flew back, even we would, for months, just text each other in the morning, just research that we were researching and talk and pray and cry together through text and over the phone. See, my oldest known family member was a man named Isaac Lockett. Shows up in the 1870 census. And in that census, he says he's 90 years old and he's living in Lake Providence, Louisiana. But also in that census, Isaac Lockett said he was originally from Virginia. You know, our slaves always took on the last names of the people who owned them, right? 
right? And, um, and he was probably willed off or either was sent to go live with another group of lockers that went from Virginia to Louisiana. So that led to another year and a half of research. And here's what we learned from the empirical evidence that we had. It was my friend Matt Lockett's family that owned our family where this kettle pot came from. So think about it. Here is my family praying for the ending of slavery. And then all the way up at the farmhouse of the people used to own them, slavery comes to end in their front yard. Mm -hmm. But then, because he's the God of the past and the future, and he loves to heal history. That's right. Mr. Poema, God himself, weaves two family members' lives together, Matt and I together. Weaves our storylines together so we can war against injustice in our day and cry for yeah, awakening in our right. time, because that's the kind of God we serve. Right. Amen. <laughs> The story is crazy. Let me, let me give you another example of God weaving this together. If you put up the next image, these folks right here, this is Napoleon Lockett and Mary Lockett. Uh, Napoleon was a, con a colonel for the Confederacy. Uh, between he and his 11 children, they owned hundreds of slaves. And his wife, Mary, she didn't like the fact that the Southern White House didn't have its own flag. So she hired a designer, and she designed and came up with the idea for the Confederates to have their own flag. And she hand-sewed it in her house with her friends. In other words, Matt's family is the quote-unquote Betsy Ross for the Confederacy. <laughs> they invented the Confederate flag. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see the Confederate White House, and there's the flag that she uh, created called the Stars and Bars. And they thought, well, it looks too much like the Union battle flag. On, on the battlefield, so let's come up with our own Confederate battle flag, and then if you put up the next slide, there you see the, uh, the battle flag that we're really, really familiar with. The next slide, please. Yeah, there, that's that one. But here's the deal. Think about it. <laughs> because God heard the prayers of black Christian slaves and white Christ, Christian abolitionists, abolitionists in this family and all around the country. Think about it. Through the same family where the flag of rebellion was raised up, next slide, the flag of surrender goes up in their front yard because God heard praying people. Isn't that powerful? Yeah. Yeah. So what we really want you to understand at this part of the story yeah. is that it wasn't th this stuff that you've just heard. This isn't what connected Will and I in our relationship and in our friendship. We didn't learn any of this until we had been praying together for almost a decade. See, we met way back in 2005, and we just began to strike up a friendship and a relationship that just began to grow and deepen, and we just started doing life together. I love this man. I love his family. I fight for his dreams. He fights for my, my dreams, and I kind of think that's how this is supposed to work. Amen. Amen. You know? And after 10 years of praying together, not just for our own dreams, but contending for God's dream for this nation, it's almost like God says, okay, now I think I can trust you with a little something. Let me lift the curtain and show you something I've been working on for a while. And the curtain goes up and, ah! <laughs> but you know what he did? He left us there. <laughs> he left us in that moment of, that, of discovery for almost a year and a half. Yeah, a year and a half. Go ahead. Yeah, so we're stuck in that place, and uh, let me take a little time to, to describe this. At first, it was like, oh, man, you could win the prayer movement, right? Praying people, we love when God answers prayer. We're thinking, oh, my God, this is a trip to think of 300 million people in America. We meet each other at the Lincoln Memorial on MLK Celebration Day at a prayer meeting, son of former slaves, son of former slave owner. This is a trip. But after about four months, the honeymoon was over. And I realized, like, hold up. I finally have a face connected to the stories of pain from my family. But I'm in a crazy place because it's connected to the face of somebody that I love. And so now I'm trying to, feel, trying to address in my mind and in my eye, mind's eye and my heart how my friend's family could ever be my family's enemy. But then I remember why God gave me the dream. I emptied my baggage even more. And you know what I did? I went to a deeper level of forgiveness. And for me, you can understand, like, like after 10 years of listening to this story, I found out that I'm not just connected to the story. I'm actually connected to this, that part of the slave owner. Y'all, that was hard to find that out because this was no longer 
uh, uh, it wasn't just a story about other people. This was a story about somebody that I love. And suddenly there's now a face to the pain of an entire community. And I have to deal with that in a whole new way. But I'm so thankful for God because when he reveals his handiwork, you know, we get glimpses, but there's always more. It was after about a year and a half, he lifted the curtain a little bit more. And we found out this amazing history in my family. And it's a story of revival that came to that part of Virginia where the Lockett Homestead was. And as I'm reading a historical book about this revival that came, I learned that one of my ancestors, Daniel Lockett, was caught up in that revival and became a Methodist circuit rider. Do we have any Methodists here? Maybe there's some Methodists that are listening to us on the web stream or on radio today. Listen, I love this, the history of the Methodist church because the country was spreading out and there were no churches. And the preachers, the circuit riders, were the hardcore preachers that would take the gospel to the people wherever they were. And they, they did it on horseback. And in their saddlebags, they carried not just Bibles and hymnals, but they also carried at that time a legal document called a manumission form. And what that was is that was a legal document that allowed you to set your slaves free. Now, how'd you like to be in that altar call where you come forward and you are told, oh, by the way, it is for freedom that Christ sets you free and you're given the opportunity to set your slaves free at the same time. We know that is exactly what happened because when you study it, everywhere the circuit riders went, the population of freed slaves exploded in the colonies and in the early parts of this nation. And so when I look at this, yes, I had slave owners in my family, but God had already started a storyline in my history and it was that of revival and abolition. Isn't that powerful? So think about it. Yeah, he had slave owners in his family, but he also had revivalists and abolitionists in the same family. Right? And, and uh, it's just like my family. We had I have family members in prison. I've done stupid stuff, but thank God for folks like these who are praying for revival, praying for the ending of slavery, praying for the healing of our nation. It's like all of our stories and our families, we have these things called generational blessings and generational curses, right? They represent these dominating themes of storylines. And what God is shouting to us right now, Vasilia, is this. What storyline do we want to be a part of? The healing or the hurt? The blessing or the curse? What storyline do we want to be a part of? Last, last story. I'll give you an example of what Will's talking about. After slavery ended, it's about 1867, and it's there at the Lockett Homestead area in Virginia. There is a former slave that's trying to teach her young son how to read and write. Now, at that time in history, during the time of slavery, it was illegal for slaves to learn how to read and write, and it was illegal for anyone to teach them how to read and write. But guess what? After slavery ended, still wasn't very popular. And so there was a legacy of secret prayer meetings that continued even after slavery ended where this mother is in secret trying to teach her young son how to read and write because she feared that there would be consequences if they were caught. And in one night walks Lucy Lockett one of my family, and she catches them red-handed. And I have to interpret it this way, that in that moment, Lucy had to choose which storyline she wanted to be a part of, the blessing or the curse. And in that moment, Lucy says, she tells the mother, no, what you've chosen to do is very wise. And we know the, this level of detail in the story because that young boy, he went on to become tutored by Lucy Lockett, and then he wrote about this in his autobiography. His name was Robert Russomoton, he went on to become president of Tuskegee Institute, replacing Booker T. Washington. He was an educational advisor to presidents. And can you put up the last slide, please? In 1922, he gave the dedication speech of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., where 41 years after this moment, Dr. King would stand right there and declare, I have a dream. And 41 years after that speech, Will and I would meet on the exact same spot. Isn't that crazy? So think about it. This happened to two men who were led by dreams to meet each other in a prayer meeting at, on MLK Celebration Day at the Lincoln Memorial, at the place where Dr. King said, I have a dream that one day the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. Listen, y'all, maybe the dream speech ain't just poetry. Maybe it's prophecy. Maybe there's a dream king called the King of Kings. 
Father, still answering his prayers. Father, I pray that they be one so that your glory can come so that the world would believe. Maybe God hadn't forgotten about the prayers of your mama and your papa. We know he overheard his son praying for us. And it should wreck us. It should grab our hearts. I just want somebody to know here today, listen. Somebody pray for you. This is a praying church. It's not a mistake or a coincidence that you're here right now, listening in the sound of my voice, whether you're on live stream or listening on radio. You, you are not a mistake. This moment is no mistake. That's right. We think it's cliche. God loves you and has a credible plan for your life. No, this is a pretty, yeah. <laughs> pretty good he illustration. He really does love you. And he, he really does, really does love you. He has an incredible plan for your life. I talked about family members that we knew in our family who were beat to death just for going fishing without asking. Unwillingly, of course. But listen, Jesus Christ willingly gave his back to be beaten for us all. By his stripes, he's healing your history. That's right. And by his blood, he wants, to re he wants to unite you to his unfinished business because he has a plan for your life. So if you're here right now, every head bowed, every eye closed, You listen on the radio, online. You don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. All the things you've been going through. This season where social distancing has revealed the social distance in our heart. Maybe God had this time to separate you from everybody else so you could be separated unto him. He's been trying to get our attention for too long. He's trying to get your attention right now. And he loves you. You've been the victim some, of some bad choices in your family. Generational curses have set up besetting things for you to just stumble in from alcoholism to drug abuse to sexual immorality, everything else. You've been seeing that storyline going along in your family, hatred and bigotry. You've been seeing that storyline. But listen, you still have unfinished business. One, I believe there was a praying family member in your family. But then two, even beyond that, I know the greatest intercessor who still lives is making intercession for you right now. That's right. That's right. And you can be part of his unfinished business in your own life and release generation of blessings. In other words, the curse can stop with you and the blessings can begin to flow now. So right now, you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and say, just say this little prayer for me. Pray with me. Jesus, I'm ready for a new change. I'm ready for a new start. I forgive the sins of the past. I forgive the sins of my forefathers of alcoholism, drug abuse, bigotry, hatred. And I ask you to come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins and give me a new start today in your family. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord a clap and a shout. Now, listen, we want to agree with you in prayer. There's some amazing folks that are going to come down here and pray for you. If you said that prayer for the first time, come on down. We want to meet you. We want to pray with you right now. Come on down, whoever you are, wherever you are in this building. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on, church. Somebody else, I know. Come on. Come on. <laughs> this morning I was praying and the Lord spoke to me. And I feel like this word is for you. This time of transition that you've been in, your transition has been in transition. But everything is about to change. You're about to move into a, the timing of God for your life right now. The curses are being broken. And you're moving from what the Bible calls the chronos time into his kairos moments where God changes everything just like that. This is that moment right now. Say your name for me, sir. Mike. So, Lord, for Mike right now, God, I thank you that everything changes now in the name of Jesus. God, we come against every generational curse, 
abuses from the past. And we God, we thank you for a new start today and newness of life. I thank you for praying mama and his family. I thank you for unfinished business he's going to take up. And I thank you for blessing the works of his hands this day for God. Fill him with your spirit and the power of your love. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, y'all. Give the Lord a clap. Shout out.